field trip and it's nice to make a new trip down here from our typical spot. My name is Ryan Mayer. I'm one of the organizers here at the One Million Cups. And uh, so uh, Steve, our presenter for today, is a guy that I've known for a few years and uh, thought all along that he'd be kind of a great fit. And so we thought, it's like, well, hey, this would be a great opportunity to do something new at the One Million Cups. So, so uh, we had the space here to do it, so we figured let's present in the space, add a little bit of new element to that. So um, before we begin, we'll, we'll thank our sponsors for the day. Our coffee sponsor being Hawthorne Coffee. So. All right. Okay. Yay! Uh, you guys can keep putting coffee over here so if you want to refill as we go. Refills there if uh, you did catch that. Uh, and so uh, and my firm was small, little studio. Handling video for now. Um, so Steve, come on up and get started. So as you are um, tweeting or posting about this event, of course, we've got the 1MC MKE hashtag that you can use um, at Hawthorne Coffee. Hawthorne C O Twitter. Hawthorne C O. Alright, there we go. Okay, well we gotta make we can make sure you get it right. Hawthorne C R. Alright, and with no further ado. Steve Hoffman. Hey guys. Uh, thanks for coming, I appreciate it. Um, people have been here before. Yes, no. Alright, so um, I started Hawthorne Coffee about three years ago now. Uh, I've been in the coffee industry for 17 years, give or take. So I'm from a kind of walk as well. Um, I worked at a little coffee shop there. I got the job kind of by accident. I, Love drinking coffee. I stopped at the shop every morning on my way to school. One morning, I didn't have enough money to actually pay for my coffee, so I smiled really pretty at the girl working, and she said no. And then uh, there was a sign <laughs> that said, "Fill out an application, and get a free coffee." So I was like, "All right, awesome." So I filled out this application in about six seconds, turned it in, grabbed my coffee, went to school. Uh, around lunchtime, I got a phone call from the store manager asking me to come in for an interview. I went in for the interview and um, decided that well, I'll give coffee a shot for a while. So I worked at that cafe for the, my last two years of high school, going into college. It was uh, Stone Creek, actually, on the Conmo. Um, I moved with a company here to Milwaukee. I worked at the Shorewood store. I was a roaster for a while. I was a maintenance guy. Uh, I managed two different stores. I was a buyer for everything but coffee. So I was buying paper cups and straws and everything boring about coffee. And then. Um, one day I just became the coffee buyer, sort of, again, by accident, and the job was open, and I said, yeah, I'll do that. And I ended up traveling all over the world, um, meeting with farmers, buying coffee, negotiating contracts, learning what coffee was at its sort of root level, and that's where I kind of fell in love and decided that coffee was what I was going to do with my life. Um, I came back from my very first trip knowing that I needed to tell the story of what coffee was from the people's perspective of growing the coffee. Um, stayed with Stone Creek for a while and then just had one of those moments of knowing like I can't really do this the way I want to for somebody else. I have to do it on my own. Um, got a little fed up one day and my wife who's working behind the counter over there and I uh, went down to Kansas City and we sat in one of our favorite coffee shops there and looked around at how simple it was and it was two guys that just, you know, bought a roaster, put it in an old check cashing place. Uh, they had a tiny little counter with two stools at it, did 100% pour over. They had no refrigerator, so they couldn't give you any cream for your coffee. They didn't believe in sugar, so there was no sugar. Um, it was just coffee at its most basic level. And I looked at her and I said, we could do this. I'm going to do this. And uh, we came back, ended up getting fired from my job. Um, didn't know what I was going to do because I was broke and we had our second kid on the way at the time. And uh, so we talked a little bit. I met up with a business partner who said, hey, I've got some money and I'm looking to do something. And I said, hey, I've got an idea, but I've got any money. And coffee and coffee started. So we bought my first roaster, which is still in the back. And after this, we can go take a little walk if anyone wants to go check it out. A little two pound coffee roaster, a two kilo coffee roaster. Um, the idea was that I was going to roast for restaurants and I was going to try and make the best espresso in Milwaukee, which I did. And uh, but I had some trouble getting people to like, just want to buy their espresso from me. Like, you know, buy your coffee from other guys and use their equipment, but just buy your espresso from me. And people didn't quite latch onto that idea the way I thought they would. So I um, started doing farmer's markets. Uh, we had a little 
storefront in West Dallas that wasn't open to the public. I did all my roasting there. And we did farmer's markets the first year in Wauwatosa and Greenfield. And then the next year I expanded it to Wauwatosa, Oconomowoc, and Greenfield. And now we're in our third year of farmer's markets doing Wauwatosa, Waukesha, and Greenfield again. Um, about a little over a year ago, um, we realized we were starting to outgrow our little 800 square foot spot in West Dallas. And I was looking for new places, and I live eight blocks from here, and I was driving by this building every day saying, like, what is going on there? And I um, called the alderman, say, hey, who owns that place? It's been empty for a couple of years. The last thing, the last time I was in this building, it was a uh, pirate fusion restaurant called Shiver Me Timbers. And then it was like, <laughs> <laughs> which um, you might be surprised to hear was actually very terrible. <laughs> Nothing Shot. good about it. <laughs> uh, after that, it was uh, a couple of failed restaurants, and then it was a bar called the Rodeo Bar that the city ended up actually shutting down. They had so many complaints from the neighborhoods that revoked their liquor license, put a moratorium on any liquor licenses in this building for three years. So all these restaurants, bars tried to come in here, they're like, wait, I can't sell booze, I'm out of here. <laughs> so we had a building in here for two and a half years, and I said, well, I don't need a liquor license, and came in. Uh, set up shop in the roaster. The building was in really rough shape. It took us some time to get it cleaned up to kind of this very basic level that you see here. Um, and then we opened up shop here in November to the public. Um, and I found out that while I was still trying to push my wholesale business, that the retail side of things kind of took off. The neighborhood really embraced us. And people coming in the door every day. Um, so most of our business right now is what walks through the door. Um, the reason I wanted to do all of this kind of still goes back to that first trip I took and seeing people, you know, the, all the hard work and labor and, and passion that went into growing coffee at the farm level. I wanted to bring that same passion, you know, to the, the cup level. So my, our goal is to find kind of the very best coffees that we can find in the world, um, roast them the best way I know how. I've spent many, many hours and a lot of blood, sweat, and tears learning how to roast coffee the very best that I can. I have a style that's my own now, and uh, I think it, I, I know it's the best in the city. Uh, and then brew the coffee by hand, one cup at a time, and create sort of an individual experience for the person who's drinking that coffee. So, as you all saw, there's no big machines here. We don't push buttons and have coffee come out of it. Everything's done by hand because that's how it's done at the farm. That's how we do it here. Um, I've had some success outside of the cafe here in the wholesale market uh, when you guys may have heard of Foley and Moly Coffee and Donuts, little donut shop in the third ward. So when they were first opening, they actually gave us a call and said, hey, we need a coffee partner to get this all started. We worked with them and actually ran their cafe for the first six months that they were open, turned it back over to them, um, ended up getting our coffee into the rest of the restaurants in their group. Um, and then we enjoyed a great relationship there for a little over a year. They decided to go to a different direction with coffee recently, so now they're serving different coffee, and we're back to kind of really focusing here, but also looking for new partners in the wholesale market, restaurants, cafes, specialty food retailers that um, will sell our coffee for us as well. So three years in, um, things have gone pretty well. I think the struggles I've had have been because our operation is so small. I mean, it's myself doing all the roasting, it's my wife running the show, CC is here with us, uh, handles most of our farmers markets. A couple of other people that help us out as well with events and, and markets. Uh, but really, it's us kind of doing everything. So getting out there and getting you know, getting our name out, having more awareness, um, going on sales call, stuff like that, has been a little bit of a struggle for us. Uh, this, just a few months ago, I upgraded to a larger roaster. Uh, my original roaster, I was roasting about 10 pounds an hour. On my new roaster, I can roast up to 60 pounds an hour, so my my time chain machine has been freed up quite a bit. So that's the next step for me to get out of the door and go talk to more people about what makes our coffee so good. And that's all I got for you. So what? Yes. What makes the place? So why does the restaurant change decide to change the vendor like that? Um, so, I'll start with a comment on restaurant coffee service in general. Um, it's always amazed me that you can walk into a, you know, a world-renowned restaurant and have a top-notch, farm-to-table, like, super amazing meal. Um, 
and then you order a cup of coffee at the end and it comes from a bag of pre-ground shit that is roasted <laughs> like a hundred miles away and tastes terrible and that's your last impression of that meal you have at a restaurant. Like, mm -hmm. Restaurant coffee in general for a long time has been terrible. That tide is starting to turn. But the problem is that restaurants have gotten used to paying four or five dollars a pound for the coffee. Um, my most affordable coffee uh, wholesale is going to cost about eleven dollars and twenty cents a pound. I pay more for it because it's good, and I get more money directly to the farmer. Um, some restaurants struggle with that a little bit. They struggle seeing the where that value comes. Even though, again, that same cup of coffee. How many of you have ever actually gone to a really nice restaurant and looked at how much the coffee costs in the menu? Yeah, like, they can charge you eight dollars for it. You're not going to know. Probably. Plus, like fifty-two dollars you just paid for the steak. Exactly. Yeah. You're, you're never going to know. So it's like I've tried to explain that. Like charge whatever you want for the goddamn coffee. Like people aren't going <laughs> to know what it is. Yeah, it doesn't even <laughs> dent the bill. All right. Yes, sir. Uh, your coffee is delicious, by the way. Thank you. And have you ever thought of doing? Uh, what uh, a drive through that just, you know, set it up to, that you can pick it up area to, to brew the coffee and take care of the cars coming through. But, uh, yeah. It, it's a, not around this part of the country, but in other parts, it's really very, very big. Yeah, I've thought about drive throughs a lot. My my hesitation with them right now is that I'm not, I'm still not willing to mass brew the coffee. I want to do it all by hand like this. So. If I thought I could do a drive through and people would be patient and wait three minutes and 30 seconds per cup, I mean, you can have multiple people going, so we could speed it up a little bit. Um, but I see, I definitely see a wait in that drive through line. And knowing myself, I went to a Starbucks down here on 6th and Layton uh, recently, so I wanted to try their slow, cold brew garbage. And um, I waited about 10 minutes in line in the drive through, and I was irate. I mean, me that makes people wait 10 minutes for coffee all the time. Like, I was irate when I got to the window that I had to wait so long, so I could imagine other people. Um, I'm not closed off to the idea at all. I think that there is, I have three small children, so I know what it's like to not, to not be able to get out of the car, not even to not want to, to not be able to like leave the car and go in and get coffee. Um, I would just need to find a way to do it that is uh, efficient and wouldn't you just need one of these guys in here to make you a quick app so you can order it from like two blocks away. That, and so that's run it up. To the app thing has been a discussion for quite a while. Um, I, I definitely want to learn how to do that in a way that the order comes to us and that, because that's what I think we could do right here <laughs> in this location is curbside pickup. Like, send us in your order and we'll just run it out to you so you can go pay on the app and everything. So. <laughs> Uh, yeah, your uh, your comments about the, about the restaurant. Uh, we actually had that experience with a restaurant on on uh, in Wisconsin mm -hmm. that followed your philosophy, mm -hmm. and they happened to source from uh, Baraboo Coffee Roasters, and the coffee at the end of the meal was so good we actually wound up buying our our home coffee from Baraboo mm -hmm. after that, um, and so that can work and makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Um, the other thing that I wanted to ask you though is, all right, so if you're after the world's best coffee, mm -hmm. how do you find the world's best coffee? Um, so a lot of that came from my time in Stone Creek when I was traveling the world. So how I found it sometimes was my total accident. Like I landed in Guatemala one time, I had no plan. It was just like, I'm in Guatemala, I'm gonna go find coffee. Um, and I started with, there's a, a coffee association there. And so I went to them and said, hey, from America, I want to find good coffee. And they took me to some places, and you know, I once found an amazing coffee by being in this really big sort of mass coffee processing mill, and looking across the street, and I just happened to see a tiny little like hand mill. I was like, hey, what's that? And they're like, well, that's you know, Jose across the street. Like, he's got some coffee in his yard that he does, and we like, well, let's go talk to Jose, and we walk across the street, we talk to him, and we try his coffee some of the best damn coffee I've ever had in my life. And, you know, he makes like two bags of it, you know, the bags are 150 pounds, he makes like 300 pounds of coffee a year, that's it. But it's some of the best coffee you can find. So 
working for a larger company, it was hard to, like it didn't make a lot of sense for us just to buy two bags of Jose's coffee. Now for me, it makes a whole lot of sense for me to buy those two bags of coffee. So I have many connections and people I met and things I saw that I couldn't take advantage of as part of a larger organization and now I'm able to leverage those relationships and get some of that stuff here. Yes, sir. So your model is basically, or your, your brand is, you know, one-to-one, -one, uh, you know, intimate experience, mm -hmm. quality coffee, but your biggest, your, your big your money you make is wholesale to restaurants. Do you have any kind of quality control program so that that coffee is brewed in a way that reflects well on the quality coffee? Yeah, so that was, we, we had some problems with that, with this first kind of big relationship with the restaurant group. Um, and something Kendra and I talked about, an idea she had was the, the pots that they brew the coffee into um, get very dirty. And if you don't clean them appropriately every night, it's going to get, you can put the best coffee in the world into it, it's going to taste like McDonald's because the pot's dirty. So we came up with this idea of, she came up with this idea of um, switching out their pots every time you deliver coffee. Like, kind of like our, my friend Dan here sells us towels. So like, we use towels, we dirty them up, he brings clean ones and takes the dirty ones away. You know, we'll give you a pot, brew into here, when we deliver your coffee, we'll take this pot back, give you a clean one, clean it, and keep switching them all. So that's, no one else is doing that. Um, requires a little bit more of an investment when you get coffee and someone here actually washing the pots, but to me, it's ultimately worth it because the coffee will taste the same in that restaurant as it does when I'm sitting here making it for you myself. Yes, sir. Um, so the reality, just building on Mike's uh, comment, is this is not a, like a scalable business model that becomes, I mean, it's impossible to scale what you're doing, which is okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have no desire to be a Starbucks. Don't care. Yeah, no, I, I have no desire to ever be a Starbucks or anything. I mean, uh, the one thing I didn't talk about is why my name is on the company and on all the bags and all the cups you're drinking. Um, I had a different name for the business picked out when Kendra and I were just talking about this. Originally, it was going to be Barrel Proof Coffee Roasters, um, and that came from, I tend to drink a lot of bourbon, and <laughs> Barrel Proof <laughs> Bourbon is like 100% undiluted, right out of the barrel stuff, you know, and so I, like my passion for this coffee is 100% undiluted, you know, Barrel Proof Coffee. And we did some focus groups, people didn't quite get it, they thought that there was going to be booze in the coffee. And, um, <laughs> which is not a bad thing, by the way. Um, <laughs> and so my business partner actually said, well, why, why would we just call coffee or coffee? It's really about like, you and how you like coffee. And I, I'm kind of a, like, a humble guy. I don't really like a lot of attention. Um, I'm incredibly uncomfortable sitting here right now in front of all of you. <laughs> but uh, to me, the reason I ultimately agreed and said, yes, let's put my name on it, is it's sort of this, it is the, <coughs> the biggest um, motivator I can have is to have my family's name on this product. Like I come from kind of a long line of blue collar, hardworking guys, and to uh, allow something to go out with this name on it, it is less than my very best, is not acceptable to me. So um, we put my name on it, and if you look at the bag sitting up there, I hand label and date and then sign my name to every bag that I roast, um, kind of giving it my. This is, I approve of this, this is good, I stand behind it. Um, so yeah, that could not be a, a, a national level coffee, and I just, I don't care about that, I don't want to do that. Yes? So are you uh, promoting the social aspects of what you're doing? Uh, not well enough. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, most of us found out about this, you know, because Brian Reeves was uh -huh, right. cute, yeah. you know. And, that's that's how people have found out about me now. Is that yeah, and yet you know, I, I would drive from where I live, you know, 25 minutes to come here to have coffee mm -hmm. um, because I like the coffee, but also because I've been to Guatemala. I get it, you right. know, and if we don't, it's it's beyond fair trade, right? Right. Yeah, yeah I think that um, you know, so social media is something that once upon a time before I had kids, I was pretty active on because I didn't have anything else to do. And now, you know, like now when I'm on social media, it's putting up pictures of my kids. And like I, I tried for a while. Like I go through waves. Like you can look at the Hawthorne Coffee Twitter and Instagram 
feeds, it's like there'll be a lot of activity and then there's nothing for a while, and a lot of activity and then there's nothing. Um, so that's that's something that I, I, I do need to work on and just being more consistent with you know posting and, and being current with like I've got two new copies that I haven't even talked about yet. Like that's stupid, right? I should be talking about those. Um, and then and then you know bringing the story of the coffee itself like because we're so small right now i can't go like i can't actually go to a farm and directly import coffee like i was for the bigger company i have to work through brokers now and i have good relationships and able to do that but it's been i haven't actually been on the ground in guatemala or anywhere else for a couple of years now um i've been chained to the machine back there really honing that part of my craft <coughs> So one of my goals in the next year is to get back to the farms and get back to these people that I've kind of started relationships, started projects with, and see if we can boost some of that back up again. And um, that always gives me fresh passion to come back and you know, talk about that. Right now, you know, I'll talk to you, to you all day about kind of what I'm doing with my new roaster and how I'm getting that tuned in. When I come back from a trip, all I want to talk about is that trip that I was just on and all these people that I met. So it's, for me, it's really about like, where I'm at in the year and now. Um, so I, but, so to answer the question, no, I'm not doing a very good job of that, but I do know that I need to. Mm -hmm. But it's a testament to how it works. I met Steve through Twitter. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and now you all are here. It's those stories about Guatemala <clears throat> that are what people need to hear. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that's, that's the sizzle. Right. Um, and, and those have got to be great stories. And well told, that would be you know fun reading. Uh, yeah, I had. I mean, I had like a great blog going when I was at Stone Creek, and like I had whatever, or maybe thousand Twitter followers because he, he posted a picture of a. You know, I was in Africa for a month, and you know, he put a picture of an elephant up, saying like just another day in the office. All of a sudden, people were like, "What are you doing? <laughs> you have the greatest job in the world," which was true. I mean, it, it is a great job. Um, and that's why I do know that, that those stories need to come back. Yes, sir. Does your model allow for having multiple locations? Yeah, that's something I want to, um, you know, I love this location here because it's nine blocks from my house. Um, these are my neighbors that are coming in every day, and I'm very well supported by that. Um, I think it is, like, I want this to be a destination that People say like this is the best coffee in Milwaukee, so I need to go. Like I will drive from Shorewood to the South Side of Milwaukee to get coffee. I don't. I think that's a little bit of a hard sell sometimes. Like coffee hasn't quite risen. So we, we share a space with this barbecue restaurant, which we can talk about. Um, you know, barbecue is one of those things that people are very passionate about. There's not a lot of it in Milwaukee. People drive from all over the place to come and have this barbecue. We get to ride in the coattails, we're like, oh, there's coffee here too. Holy shit, this coffee is really good. Um, coffee isn't one of those things because there is a lot of it in the city right now that people are necessarily going to say, like, all right, I'm going to go and drive, you know, down to the airport to get coffee. Um, so I, I think there is, I think there is a way we could do a satellite location. Um, food truck has been on my mind for uh, years now, and doing a coffee truck, I think. Like if I can't, what do they say? Take Muhammad to the mountain, take the mountain to Muhammad. Like I'll, like I'll get the truck and go drive and make coffee for people. Um, now can I make that? Can I buy a truck and I'll fit it and do all that and make my money back selling two dollar fifty cent cup of coffee? I hope so. <laughs> but um, yes, I think it does a lot for it. Yes, sir. Speaking of food trucks, have you thought of having the food trucks up here? Yeah. Have you the food trucks up here for lunches and stuff. Yeah. Um, so the, one of the things that we need to do is the parking lot right across the street from here is ours. Um, and I have been thinking about doing like a Saturday or Sunday like food truck court thing over there for a while, like let them all park out there and have our own little market basically. Um, do what, you know, move our setup outside, brew coffee outside, we're really good at that. Uh, I think it's a great idea. I think that, because that's, again, Food trucks are something that's like people, when they hear about a unique one, it's like they will go track it down. I do it, it's like I'll get on Twitter, like, where is you know, the Oscars burger truck today? I'll go find it because I want that goddamn burger. Like, 
thing. I need to do that for coffee too. Are you part of the uh, gateway group down here? I'm not. I mean, um, not officially. Like, I know the guy and we talk all the time, but I'm not like a card carrier. Because I wonder if they could help uh, help expedite that. I know they can. I know they can. And are you are you familiar with uh, Buena Vida Coffee? Yeah, I helped start up from Marquette. Yeah, when I was at Stone Creek, I helped them start up. Okay. Yes. Have you thought of like, partnering with some, you know, identifying some signature restaurants that would actually do, you know, one to one, you know, moving and then maybe brand the, mm -hmm. you know, the, the hot water hot and make that experience with the table uh, or even people do it just like with people make their tea and then dipping in and sort of that sort of thing. We were talking about this morning, so my, my very first wholesale customer, um, who is still a customer today, is Ardent, a little restaurant over on the east side. It's been nominated for three James Beard Awards. Probably, arguably, the best restaurant in Milwaukee. What's the name? Ardent. Um, it's got 22 seats. It's in a basement. There's no sign. Like, you would never know it was there, but it, it is phenomenal. They do um, the Red Light Ramen pop-up shop every Friday and Saturday and have lines wrapped around the block trying to get in there to eat ramen noodles. Um, so they were our first, and they brew all the coffees with the Chemex, all single pour. They started out doing it table service, but the, the struggle there was like trying to get the servers excited enough to want to go and like do the pour over right at the table and talk about it as they're doing it. Like they've got 500 other things on their mind while they're trying to get through a service to have to go and like do the pour over table side. It was a little bit of a tough sell. So they still do the pour over, they do it in the kitchen and take it out. Um, a couple of times I've happened to be there at the end of their dinner service and they say, hey Steve, that table over there wants coffee, here you go, and they send me over. Um, and it's been really powerful when I've done that. Table, like people, they've gotten letters written to them about like, how cool was it that the guy who roasted my coffee actually showed up next to my table to brew it for me. Now, obviously I can't be at every restaurant in the city all the time doing that, but you know, picking restaurants and going and doing that letting servers see how excited people can get by hearing the story of the coffee while we're brewing it. I think that is the way to, um, to help make that not a chore, but a, a, something they can see. I mean, to me, because I, I bartend in the evenings, I know that the more I put into a, like an interaction, the more I get out of it in the form of my tip. And so like trying to get servers to recognize that too, like, hey, you go through this whole meal, like, like you've put a lot of effort into it to get this tip. The cherry on top can be this amazing coffee service. Like, they think that they've had all that they can have, handle this meal. Now you give them this amazing coffee service at the end, like, people are gonna go crazy over that. So I, I had this idea too about, you know, is there a way that I can include a barista with the sale of my coffee? Like, so a restaurant buys coffee for me and includes a person that comes to your place you know, Fridays and Saturday nights and brews coffee for you. I haven't figured out how to make the, the nap work kind of yet, but I think there's something to that as well. It's funny it's that you just said that, and I was just going to say, what if the coffee came with the person? Right. Um, but um, I think there's a lot to that, really. You know, you think if you go into, you know, Mexican restaurants with the table side guacamole, mm -hmm. and it's, oh, that's all that person does. Right. Is go around and make guacamole, and she's got her own tip jar, because it doesn't you know, Right. People see it as a different thing from the rest of the service. So I think you probably would lose a little bit with the server doing it. But That's I think right. having, I think the kind of the model of what you said where you showed up and they said, how cool was it that this guy came and did this? I think the thing that you would get in time with having one of your people being on site doing that and that you every now and then would make a guest appearance. Right. I think you probably still get that same kind of buzz yeah. just by the handful of times it's like, oh, this time the guy that roasted it showed up. How right. cool is that? And it just kind of went up it overall. But years ago, we were talking before you opened this place about how you wanted a place that was kind of like a speakeasy for coffee, uh -huh. where you can kind of go off to the side and have this kind of separate experience. Yeah. Is that still something that you want to do here or yeah. is that kind of shelved? No. Um, so one of the many secrets of this building is um, so this building was built in the 40s, so once upon a time when the Milwaukee Braves were still the baseball team in Milwaukee, um, this was a nightclub 
and the players would come here. If they were with their wives, they would come through the front door and hang out. If they were with their girlfriends, they came in through the back door, down the stairs, through a hallway, <laughs> and there was a bar downstairs that they would hang out in, away from the public eye. Um, that bar is in very rough shape and needs a lot of work, but uh, a hope of mine is to turn that bar into the speakeasy that, you know, morning hours we could sneak down there and do some special coffee stuff, evening hours we can sneak down there and do some cocktail stuff. Um, so yeah, that, that is very much alive and well. Uh, as of anything, I got a, a Facebook message from a very lovely neighbor recently with about a list of 15 things that I needed to do right away to this building to make me you know, rich beyond my wildest dreams. And uh, I very politely responded to her and said thank you for all these great ideas. I've had many of them myself. As with any startup that we can probably all attest to, there's two of us here trying to do all this and time and money really dictate what we do and when. And so, uh, so yeah, that's one of the ideas. It is, it's a, close to the top of the list because I just think that would be fun as hell. Um, but it's not happening just yet. Yes, sir. Do you do any classes where people come in and learn, learn what yeah. you talked about? Yeah, um, I have done those in the past. Um, there is this group on Facebook right now called Milwaukee Coffee Lovers. It's just a bunch of coffee dorks that want to talk about like how cool coffee is all the time. I've a couple of times like I started seeing all the time saying like, hey, what's your ratio for pour overs and you know, what's your um, preferred brew method and all this? So one day I was like, all right, screw it, guys. Uh, this Saturday morning, nine o'clock, everyone come in. I'm gonna do a pour over tutorial. You know, bring your notebooks, whatever. You can all brew a cup of coffee. I'm not gonna charge you anything. Just buy something before you leave. And um, I had like 15 people show up and do that. So that's that's another one of those things that I you know I think there's like I think I could charge five bucks and people would show up and learn how to brew coffee, or they would show up and um, you know do a, a roasting tutorial. We're we're about to go into a phase to raise a big chunk of money um, to, to upgrade some of our production here, and I'm going to use Kickstarter or GoFundMe or something to do that and. Some, some of my rewards are going to be, you know, like, come be a roaster for a day with me and we'll, we'll learn how to roast and you can roast a batch and take that coffee home with you. And, I mean, I think people have always responded pretty well to that when I've done it in the past. Another one of those things I just need to do more often. Yes, sir. Um, I mean, this is, may sound kind of weird, but are there... I love weird. <laughs> well, I mean, this has happened at this point in time. Because of a lot of things that you have been going into that people, uh, you can make it go here. Are there any trends that you think about what happens when the tastes may change? Mm -hmm. I mean, because uh, after all, some of us remember Velveeta, and we thought that was cheese. Right. You know, so <laughs> not that has changed, but we can go back to Velveeta depending on you know the whims of uh, you know how we can develop, or is this going to be open for you for the foreseeable future? Oh, maybe it's a cheese. Do you think about that at all? I do. I do it all the time. Um, okay. So, like, there is the world of coffee is two months. I mean, there is so much coffee being grown out there right now, and there's stuff. So, really, the coffee. If you go into any kind of specialty coffee roaster or cafe you're only getting about the top 2% of all the coffee grown in the world is, is being imported, bought, and served at these places. So there's 98% of the coffee that you're not even seeing. Most of it's garbage. Um, but does anyone know who the, the largest coffee producer in the world is? <laughs> so, no, Vietnam is not. Brazil is number one, Vietnam is number two. So. Have you ever seen Vietnamese coffee anywhere? I have, and I've tasted it, and it's amazing. But I had it in Vietnam. Right. <laughs> uh, Vietnam is not producing. Most of their coffee is really bad. I talked to a guy, and we found some actually some okay Vietnamese coffee that I think with a little bit of work can be amazing Vietnamese coffee. Um, but like, there's stuff like that all over the world. Like, we can go find things you've never tasted before. So as tastes change. I think I can find. I think I can follow those trends. Basically, is what I'm saying. Like I think I can continue to bring new and interesting, um, which I'm going to do anyway. So I, I, you know, part of my model is that 
I have four copies right now. So if you go to Collectivo Valentine Stone Creek, you're probably gonna see a minimum of 10, upwards of 20 copies that they have at any given time. I do four. Uh, my mind is simple. I can't really do anything more than that well. Uh, and I don't want to. Like, I want to keep the coffee fresh and rotating. Like, I, the, these are the four best that I can find right now. And I've got a little bit of them, and they're gone. I'll get four new ones in. So I can keep introducing you to new stuff. Um, stuff that you've never had before. One of, the best, one of the best things that anyone can say to me, and this actually happens all the time, people walk in here, we don't keep our cream out on the table anymore. Um, I'm not gonna not give people cream like some places do. Like if you ask for it, I'll give it to you. But I want you to try it first. And people are trying the coffee, they're like, holy cow, I don't actually need to add cream or sugar to this. That's the best thing anyone can say to me. Because like, I've learned to make coffee that you don't need to adulterate to enjoy. What's your opinion on like building e-commerce versus retail and do you see either Roman being a piece of the bread? I know the challenge with retail being things that's out there that product's out of your hands and you don't control that. Right, yeah. Um, so e-commerce is something that I have never invested a lot of time in fully understanding. I use it all the time, like I buy stuff online like anyone all the time. Um, you can buy our coffee on our website. It's not something I push or spend a lot of time. I don't really know what search engine optimization is. I know that's a thing that people do to sell more stuff. Um, that I prefer to just let happen, like just let it go. I'm sure people in this room will argue with me on that, and I, you may be right. Um, retail is the thing that I get the most because it's where I've been the longest and so uh, I'm the most comfortable with it but I'm sort of I'm in a space of like okay well let's just talk about both and see what makes the most sense. I mean I, I think the reason I put an online store on my website is that I didn't want my family from out of town asking me for free coffee all the time so I was like just go buy it here you know? um, I'll give you a discount that's it uh, but people, you know, I, uh, I had a movie star order coffee from my website. No idea how he found it, I have no idea why, but he did. Like, that's awesome. Right. Yes? Uh, I like coffee, I'm going to buy some when I leave. How much do I like coffee or taste or am I going to lose usually just over right there with their perfectly good? It kept it being really good at all. Um, so if you can use some good, clean, filtered water, uh, make sure it gets to a 200 degrees, at least. Uh, 195 to 205. Um, and then grind your coffee right before you brew it. You'll be pretty close. Um, those are really the three that, like, when people ask me, like, how can I make this coffee at home? It's good water, hot water, and uh, grind fresh. You lose 50% of the flavor of your coffee seven minutes after you grind it. Fifty percent of the flavor of your coffee is gone seven minutes after you grind it. Uh, if you spend a hundred bucks on a grinder in your house, it'll be the best hundred bucks you've ever spent on. And what about storing the beans before you grind them? Uh, airtight container, out of direct sunlight, never in the refrigerator, never in the freezer. All right, well we are out of time for today. So let's... Out.